The following interview was conducted with Dolores uh, Shock Shockley, Ph.D., 1955 in pharmacology from Purdue University and also Professor Emeritus at Meharry Medical College for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, October 30, 2009 in Stewart Center. Also sitting is Professor Eric Bar Barker of the College of Pharmacy. Good morning and thank you very much. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Uh, good morning. Yes, I was born in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Uh, I guess one of the best ways to locate Clarksdale is to say it is not far from Tunica, Mississippi. And most people know about Tunica now because it's a big gambling casino town in uh, not too far from Memphis. Uh, Tunica was a, nothing but a hole in the ground when I was growing up. But uh, my early childhood was spent in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Uh, unfortunately, in the days when I was growing up, Clarksdale was a very discriminatory place, and therefore, the, for the children who were black, the city schools stopped at grade 10. After 10th grade, you had to go to the county school, which meant you had to take a, a county bus and go several miles out in the county to an inferior school. So my parents sent my older brother and myself to a boarding school in Mississippi, one of the two accredited high schools in the state of Mississippi for black people. And it was Mary Holmes High School. It was a part of a junior college, Mary Holmes Junior College, which was run by the Presbyterian Church. And one of the main reasons I was sent there was because I went to be a pharmacist and I needed chemistry and I needed a foreign language in order to not be behind when I entered a pharmacy school. So I, therefore my parents sent me to a, an accredited school. Sure. I graduated from Mary Holmes and then attended Xavier University in How'd New you Orleans. happen to select? Uh, you went to New Orleans, huh? Yes, I <laughs> went to New Orleans. Well, it wasn't much of a selection at that time. Okay. Uh, um, the there were only um, two predominantly black schools that offered pharmacy, and that was Howard University and Xavier University, and I was accepted to both of those. But my mother didn't want me going to Howard because they didn't have any residence space left for uh, females, and she didn't want me in the city of Washington, uh, not in a dormitory. So uh, I therefore went to Xavier. Good. And uh, been a, it was a Catholic school, of course, but uh, I wasn't Catholic by de denomination. But in fact, uh, when I first got there, and with the nuns who were teaching, there was some- Oh, they had nuns there at that time? Oh, they had nuns, and okay. sisters, of, sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. And uh, they, actually, the president, was a nun, Mother Agatha. Mother Agatha has came from a wealthy family who had donated so many millions of dollars to Xavier at, in, in, for, for, in terms of its uh, inception. But uh, uh, it was interesting for me because all nuns looked alike. They all of them wore they all habits. Had the same habit. They wore habits at that time. Nowadays they don't have to wear habits. They wear street clothes. Right. But then they were, they were wore habits. So I might pass a nun and call her sister Veronica, and really her name may have been Sister J Jane, you know. And it, gradually I learned to identify people. But it was it's hard when they're all dressed alike. Yeah, that's right. Very hard. Right. And especially who not coming from an environment where you had been exposed to nuns. Sure. But, Did uh, you live at was a residence facility there? Yes, there? we okay. had residence halls and uh, we had cottages as well as uh, dormitories. So. Okay. There were small houses that we lived in, uh, like maybe 10 to 12 girls uh, to a house, sure. as well as larger dormitories. I, my first two years, I lived in one of the cottages oh, uh, nice. with about 12 other girls. Sure. And um, was it was it co-ed or was it just yeah, co-ed? Yes, co co-ed. Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, the current president of uh, Xavier, Norman Francis, was two classes behind me. He has been president of Xavier now for 40 years, the longest reigning college president in the United States. How about that? Yeah, he was a... Uh, just Isn't that nice? And you got to know him when you were in school? Oh, yeah. We, were very, we went to the national meetings together and everything. Super. He had been to my ho house in Clarksdale and all that, so Good. No, I know Norman very well. Good, mm -hmm. good. 
Then after you finished there, then uh, did you, you must have had a, an interest in pharmacy over most of your life. Is that why you decided to make it? Right. I always, uh, I always uh, like to tinker with uh, chemicals. You know, uh, I call them chemicals, but they weren't really chemicals. I would pull the berries off of bushes and grind them up and strain it <laughs> and call myself make it ink. Then I'd go around the neighborhood selling it. <laughs> You and got started it, earlier as an entrepreneur. Yeah, <laughs> and the people, you know, they knew me in the neighborhood. They knew me, so they would, they didn't want the ink. They just get, do it out of, you know, <laughs> kindness to me. I thought I was really doing something. You know, I thought I was, I thought I was in business. Right. But uh, I, so I knew I wanted to be a pharmacist. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Then, then I went, we went, went, to, went to Xavier. And right. Did that. Then what came next is that what happened at, after you graduated? Well, I, I graduated. I got my license. I okay. didn't have to spend a year post-graduation to get a license because I had done my apprentice work uh, during the time I was in school. I had enough hours, so I took the uh, board exam immediately after graduation. And uh, then I had applied to graduate school at several places, and uh, including Purdue, and I, I narrowed it down to uh, come to Purdue because uh, most of my textbooks were written by Purdue ph uh, pharmacy faculty members. I had never visited Purdue. I had visited a number of Big Ten schools, but never That's Purdue. That's quite a distance from the, <laughs> Right, from, from New Orleans, a long, yeah, right. long distance, huh? Sure. And, um, but I had gone to uh, national meetings, student meetings at Illinois, University of Illinois, University of Michigan, University of Wisconsin, but never Purdue. And uh, so I came here sight unseen. Did, how did you come by train or? Uh, yeah, I came by train. Okay, uh -huh. okay. Well, did you go back home first and then came up, or when what, did you start in the fall after you graduated? I, I started in fall. I, I uh, summer after I graduated. Um, actually, I worked as a secretary for my uncle. <laughs> I didn't do pharmacy work at all because I went back to my hometown, and of course there were no pharmacists that I could work in there because there were no black black pharmacists. Another day. Uh, Majority of pharmacists would, would have, of course, let me do any work there. But I had taken a board exam and it passed, so I wasn't that interested. In sure. I was just kind of nice to do something non scientific before starting uh, graduate school in the fall. Okay. So uh, I came on to Purdue and. Um, Tell us a little bit about that when you came. <clears throat> when you came to Purdue and your experiences here. Right. Well, uh, when I came to Purdue, I stayed in the. I guess they still have it, the uh, quadrangle, women's quadrangle with the residence halls. Well, maybe there might be thinking of what used to be Meredith or something of that. It used to be the X Hall or something of that. Yeah, Some well, of it, they've changed a lot. Of right. It so it, anyway, we call it the women's quadrangle okay. at that okay. time. Okay. And uh, they allowed uh, female graduate students to stay there because it wasn't fully occupied because the undergraduate female en enrollment had, didn't, didn't fill it up. There weren't that many. Uh, undergraduate females. Okay. Most of the, if they were, weren't interested in science and engineering, then they didn't come here <laughs> until they learned that they could probably get a husband here because there was six men to every woman. <laughs> and then it filled up by the time I finished my master's and we had to move out. The graduate students had to move. Okay. And because they had no space for us then. And we occupied only one little corner of one hall. We didn't, it wasn't that many of us, you know, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, I mean, co total women graduate students. And most most of the there was variety. They had uh, clinical psychology, um, math theoretical mathematics, uh, plant physiology, all types of majors that these women graduate students were in. It was an education in itself just to yeah. talk to the people about their different majors. That's right, exactly. It was, I was the only pharmacology major who was in that dorm area. And, well, actually, I was the only pharmacology female graduate student, period. In the, in the department? In the department. Uh, the rest of them were males. But in, and so definitely there were no uh, other pharmacology females in that uh, re residence sure. hall. Okay. So I was. It was just an education to be with those different, all those different majors like plant physiology, right. theoretical mathematics. You know, you just really an education in itself. There you go. And there were people there from um, uh, Germany, uh, all over the United States, a number of people from New York State, 
and particularly in New York City. That's interesting. We're, uh, we're here. We're here in graduate school. And uh, so it was, it was a cultural and uh, educational experience to be with those sure. other, other women, you know. Yeah. What was campus like? Uh, like, where were your classes held? Uh, well, the, the I, pharmacy building? School of Pharmacy building was one, the main source, but then uh, I had a major, I mean a minor in physiology and a minor in biochemistry. Okay. So we took our biochemistry classes with the biochemistry students and physiology in, uh, with Dr. Heisland and I've forgotten which hall it was in, but uh, most of the classes were in the pharmacy building, sure. but we had classes in other uh, sure. areas, especially taking endocrinology, physiology, biochemistry. Okay. So we went across campus. Right, mm -hmm. okay. What were some of the activity? What was the campus like? Now, when you, when you had to move, where did you go next? Uh, I moved to a, uh, a for temporarily with a Presbyterian minister and his family. Good. I had belonged to a group of a group called the Panel of Americans, and this was a group consisting of a WASP, a Jew, a Catholic, Asian, and a Black American, and we were called Black. I mean, Panel of Americans. So we would go around to uh, it was so much discrimination in this town that we would go around to groups like churches, rotary clubs, so forth. We would ask, ask, we would invite ourselves. And they would, you know, let, they would uh, uh, accommodate and they'd let us come. Sure. And we'd tell them about ourselves, we had our studies here at Purdue. We were there just were like, other graduate students All well. graduate students. Okay. All of these were graduate students. And uh, we would tell them about ourselves and that we were students at, at Purdue and we were Americans just like they were, you know. That we just wanted the same things out of life that they did. We just want to be treated right. So in the process, I met this family, uh, this Presbyterian minister and his wife, when we went to their church. And when he found out that I had no place to stay after the, uh, I had to move out, he offered to rent me a room at his house for that summer. In the meantime, one of the uh, girls that I had met who was from uh, Wisconsin, she was a clinical, a clinical psychologist student, graduate student, and she and I started looking for a, an apartment together. Well, we would go around to different places where there was vacancy, and when we would appear, it would just have been filled. Oh, nice. So we were turned away so many times that we decided that she would go by herself, and if, it, if she would, it was able to get an apartment to rent, then I would come in and they wouldn't see me until after it was already rented. And that's the way we got an apartment. Oh, wow. <laughs> How about that? Oh. Otherwise, I would have had to stay in Lafayette because no black people lived in West Lafayette. Huh. None at all. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. But it worked out you got something. Oh, yeah. And I stayed it's there. We stayed in that apartment until I graduated. Super. Was it a, in, a, in a building? Because a lot of it at that time, there were a lot of apartments in houses. Was this in a house? Or? It was a duplex, actually. Oh, that's great. And we shared the, the other part of the duplex was a physics professor and his family. Oh, good. And I was thinking, I was telling Dr. Barker that I'm so sorry that I didn't journal at that time because I can't remember the details of exactly what the name of the physics professor's name was, but they were, his family was so nice. We really had a very good experience there. Sure. And then next door to us in a house was a bank president and his wife and family. Wow. And they would invite uh, me that's my, it was my uh, apartment mate, invite us over to tea, invite us over when they had some visitors. Now, this was unheard of because Super. we were just two graduate students. It's inappropriate, not inappropriate, but unlikely that under ordinary circumstances we would be invited to the bank president. But you're next door neighbors, next, eh? Yeah, right. That's right. We're and very they, neighborly here. Right, right, very neighborly. So anyway, <laughs> anyway it, it, it turned good. out to be a bit. A nice very good experience. Very good experience. Yeah. Uh -huh. Tell us a little bit about your research and also your professors that uh, what you were as you worked on your PhD. Yes. Well, for my masters, uh, the most of the time in terms of the pharmacology department at Purdue in those days, students were assigned a screening project for their masters because since uh, Purdue had a strong pharmaceutical chemistry department and also had a pharmacology department. The pharmaceutical chemistry, the synthetic department, developmental pharm uh, pharmaceuticals, 
would synthesize all these compounds, but they wouldn't know whether they would work or not. So generally, they um, in the pharmacology department, they would assign a student to screen these compounds to see if they were effective for the particular purpose that they had been uh, synthesized for. Well, for my master's, I was to um, screen a group of compounds which were supposed to be act like atropine, but be better than atropine. So I had to then try to uh, take the uh, compounds through a whole battery of tests, comparing it to the standard compound, which was atropine. Okay. Well, as it turned out, my compounds, the co all the compounds that I tested were anywhere from one-fifth to one-tenth less effective than atropine, but what it was, it gave a student a good chance to learn uh, different methodologies and to learn the scientific principles and, and methods, which for me was very important because I had never done research before I got here. When some of the students who had come from schools like Philadelphia School of uh, Pharmacy and, and Science, they had done, re these students had done research as undergraduates, but uh, and most of the um, H uh, cops, uh, H, I mean H, H, H black uh, colleges and universities, until the MBRS program came along, most of those schools didn't have any research programs at all. And my school, even though it was a very good, Xavier was excellent for science, but it had no research really in, in science. So I had never been exposed to research. So to have a screening project initially it was perfect for me right. because it gave a good introduction to right. and one of the things that uh, I really appreciate was that uh, the dean of the School of Pharmacy, Dean Jenkins, was a, a real guru in terms of research. He insisted that people be well trained so that they could go to industry or anywhere that we would be desirable entities once we graduated. So even though he had no graduate program himself because he was a dean, all the students, no matter whether they were in pharmaceutical chemistry, pharmacology, uh, just playing pharmacy or whatever, they um, they were had, trained and ready they to. Were, they were they were very well trained, and he, he insisted on that. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. What? Uh, and then your your major professor was. When, uh, uh, and my major professor for my master's okay. and my PhD were uh, Edwards and Mia. Okay. At two, they worked together. Really, they were the only two professors in pharmacology at that time. They only had two. That was How large was the, the grant? Were there many we had, graduate we, students? Yes, we had about 18 graduate students. That's pretty good. <coughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. But uh, they, there was a variety of projects that you could work on. And even though that in the pharmacology department per se, there were only these two, then there were uh, adjunct people who you know, helped in the department. So sure. it's not as, uh, I mean, we were in this big Quonset hut. We weren't isolated and compartmentalized so that it was easier to kind of uh, work, yeah, <laughs> right. work, work with the students. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, then after you got your degree, then tell us what came next. The, was that when you did the, your postdoc? At, you know, how did that come about? Well, uh, let's see, after I finished my I finished my master's, on, I was a teaching assistant, uh -huh. and then I, for, for my PhD program, they, I was uh, on the Purdue Research Foundation fellow, I was a fellow of Purdue Research Foundation. And uh, I started thinking about what I wanted to do, and I realized I wanted to do a postdoc, but I also wanted to, the opportunity to study in Europe. And uh, so I started, I looked into the potential of a, uh, getting a Fulbright Fellowship. And I went and talked to the Director of International Affairs here at Purdue and told him about my interest. So he told me to try to identify a place that I would like to go then, um, get that uh, uh, agreement from that particular place, and then come back to see them. So I did that with the help of one of the professors here in the School of Pharmacy who was from Norway. He would talk to me about Scandinavia and. It sounded very exciting. And then he told me about Professor Knud Muller, who was a professor at the Pharmacology Institute at uh, 
Copenhagen, and how he had he showed he had a copy of his textbook, and he to, told me about how he in the Scandinavian pharmaceutical circles he was a big man, you know. So he told me to write to him and see if he would be willing to accept me if I got a Fulbright. So I did con contact Professor Muller, and he said certainly, if I uh, he did all the documentation that I needed for the Fulbright application. And I went back to the international uh, office here at Purdue, and they encouraged me to con go on ahead and apply. So I applied, and I was number one on that list of recommendations. Uh, so, I, right? I, so I got the Fulbright. Super. Mm -hmm. But they, the international, in fact, I kept in contact with, uh, as I was cleaning out some of my uh, materials, not too long ago, I came across a letter that, um, the director of the international uh, office, here, office here had had written to me, telling me that he, because I, I kept in contact with him, letting him know how about my studies, and he said, "Oh, I'm going to go and tell. I will certainly tell Dean Jenkins about this latest correspondence that I've gotten from you." You know, <laughs> so nice. it was communication back and forth. Mm -hmm. That was it for how long was the fellowship for? Two years or? It was actually, I suppose, almost last for one year. Okay. But it lasted two years because the research that I got involved in, it was looking at um, effects of drugs on connective tissue. And I had done um, three publications there and was do, uh, working on the fourth one. And my year was almost over, so I asked for an extension. And they gave me almost an unprecedented one-year extension. So I stayed that extra year. And during the time, uh, the Fulbright office in uh, Denmark allowed me to go and visit uh, uh, pharmacology institutes in Finland, Norway, and Sweden. Uh, so I broaden my uh, uh, you know, knowledge of uh, Scandinavian pharmacology. Right. It was really, really very nice. Did you like Copenhagen? Did oh, I love Copenhagen. Have you been back ever, ever since then? Only or? once, and that yeah. was a few, just a few years afterwards. Since that time, I've never been back. Okay. I've wished I could go back, but I'm sure it's so much different now. But anyway, when I was there, um, Denmark, totally Denmark was uh, very homogeneous, you know, blue-eyed, blonde-haired people. They would see me walking down the st a street. Little kids would walk up to me and want to touch my hands. They wanted to see if the brown would come off. <laughs> they, Interesting. They, it was they, this innocent. The Norwegians are the, the ruddy people. <laughs> yeah, they just, uh, you know, um, very warm people. And as I said in another interview, that uh, for the first time in my life, I feel free in Denmark. I didn't feel free in Mississippi. I didn't feel free in New Orleans. I didn't feel free at Purdue. Mm -hmm. In Denmark, I was accepted for who you are, not right. in terms of your color, your skin, or anything. Right. The people were so warm and friendly. What was the house? Did they provide housing for you? <coughs> yeah, it was, yes. It was really interesting. Um, there was an apartment above the animal quarters for <laughs> guest <laughs> investigators at the Institute. And so I shared an apartment with another American girl and a Danish girl. The Danish girl was the daughter of one of the professors at the Pharmacology Institute. And so they always let the Danish girls stay there, whoever visitor came, so they could speak, speak Danish. And so it was really nice, but the uh, buildings were so sturdily constructed that even though the animals were down <laughs> below, you never got odors coming up or anything. <laughs> so they, provide, they provided housing. It was, it was really nice. Oh, that's good. <laughs> and uh, one of the nice things, at the Pharmacology Institute, almost everybody was, uh, I mean, spoke, they spoke English, although they were from all over the world, you know, uh, all different countries and continents, Africa and everywhere. And we always had our tea time. We'd have tea you time. You tea all the places you go, right? They all yeah. have tea, right? <laughs> tea. So you got a chance to talk to, converse with these people from all over the world. In fact, the uh, uh, Olympic champion in Vincent, women's champion in Vincent, worked at the Pharmacology Institute at the time I was there. And she was, you know, always, people were always asking her for uh, lessons or something like that. She was, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was fun. Oh, yeah, you had a great time. I, I always wanted to take it. fencing sometime, but I, I thought I was Earl Flynn, you know, in the movies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
Oh dear. Well then, what came next after that? Is that when you started at Meharry or when you finished? Uh, well, I had been in Meharry briefly oh. before I went to Denmark. Okay. I'd been there for like one semester. And then I returned. I was on leave of absence because they wanted me to come back. They had, did, you know, they were short, uh, in that, short staffed in that pharmacology department. So they knew that I would be going to Denmark if I got the Fulbright. And they said, well, we need you for this semester anyway, because they were teaching dentistry students, medical students, and nursing students, and they didn't have enough faculty. So they, uh, I, went back, I went back to Meharry, and then I met a man who I became my husband. He was in the microbiology department. At Meharry? At Meharry. That's where you met him? Right. He, he graduated from Ohio State in uh, microbiology, and uh, so he had been, he was hired about the same time that I was hired, and we were the youngest professors, well, we were assistant professors on the faculty. And uh, he was the youngest, and I came, and I was the youngest. <laughs> you had a team there. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, so I got married in 57, and um, so I stayed on in my hair. Then we went to uh, New York. Uh, my husband went to Rockefeller, and I went to uh, Einstein. Well, that's how you got the association there at Einstein. Right. Okay. That's right. So I went to Einstein as visiting professor of biochemistry for three years. How did you did you enjoy that? Oh, I I really liked it. Did you do teaching or research or both? I, I mainly did teaching. Okay. And um, the uh, Einstein was at that time a fairly new medical school, and it was determined to be the best. You know. So they were putting everything they could into their students sure. to try to score the highest on the national board and everything. And um, they, uh, so I, I, I would stay there in working in, mostly in research. I did uh, uh, just seminars and so forth with, with students, but not any actual teaching. I was in the Department of Biochemistry and the uh, one of the uh, foremost pharmacologists in terms of textbooks and the Bible of pharmacology was a textbook named Goodman and Gilman. And uh, Gilman, I mean, Gilman was a uh, professor of pharmacology at Einstein. While you were there? While I was there. Super. And uh, in fact, his son's name is Alfred Goodman Gilman. He was named after the, his father's best friend, and then his father. So, Dr. Barker, you probably know Alfred Goodman Gilman. Well, uh, so, um, but anyway, he was chairman of pharmacology while I was there. So, I associated with that department, although I was in the department of pharmacology. Sure. I mean, biochemistry. Right. Abraham White <coughs> was uh, chairman of um, uh, biochemistry, and he was a well-known biochemist, uh, near Nobel Prize winner, but didn't, didn't win it. But So I had a good experience at Einstein. Where, you said your husband got a Rockefeller. Where was he? When he was not at Einstein, where was he at another facility? Right, he was at the Rockefeller Institute. Oh, okay. Rockefeller now is the Rockefeller University. At that time it was Rockefeller Institute. It was in Mon Manhattan. Right. And uh, Einstein was in the Bronx. That's right. So we lived in the Bronx because we lived on the Einstein campus. Sure. They had efficiency. He, he could take the subway and you were closer. That's right. <laughs> Good planning. <laughs> right, perfect. <laughs> but, and it, plus, then I, mean, I was, you know, close to the zoo and the right. uh, botanical gardens and all that. So, See, right. Yeah, right. All the cultural events. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, then, what, then you went back to Meharry. Tell went us a little about to, your. Both, both of us went back to Meharry. Right. Tell us a little about the work that you've done there and working with the students and then. How it came about? You worked with somebody at, at Vanderbilt, or you exchanged with the students, right? Yeah. Well, I um, I uh, you became chair of the department, the head. Right. Well, I, that was much later, but in in terms of uh, the work working uh, with students at Meharry, both my husband and I felt committed to working with students, and because we felt we we identified with Meharry's mission. And um, during the late 60s and early 70s, if you were a trained minority, black, you could take your pick of positions you wanted because everybody was looking for their one black to fill a 
position, you know, token. And so we were offered positions all over the country. You both, know, you both were, you uh, were offered positions. Oh yeah, my husband well. and I both huh. were offered uh, positions as a package, separately or whatever. FDA, even government, FDA just constantly was calling me to try to get me to uh, apply for. And then universities um, uh, all around, because that was the height of the civil rights movement. And um, in terms of affirmative action and universities trying to demonstrate that they really were uh, committed to affirmative action, they wanted any black uh, they could find, you know. Hmm. And so government, industry, whatever, academia, but we stayed in Meharry. But uh, in those days, uh, see the number of qualified, well, I don't say qualified, but the number of people who had received degrees were very limited in terms of higher degrees, PhDs. And therefore, those that they could identify were, it, it were sought after. Sure. And that's why, I, in terms of so many national committees, you know, I served on any number of committees and went to site, I guess I must have site visited at least a uh, hundred schools because when they would look for, they needed a pharmacologist mm -hmm. and they had one of the uh, black pharmacologists, female, then there were so many, few to pick from that they would pick me. You were yeah. pretty busy. I was pretty busy, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And, uh, but we, we liked working with students. We liked uh, the idea that Meharry was committed to taking in students that uh, maybe wouldn't get admitted to some of the students would not definitely get admitted to other schools. And uh, again, with this splurge of affirmative action, schools all over the country wanted their one student, one black student, um, two or three. But what we were seeing was that that one or two or three black students never got to the second year. They were, but they were carried from the first year to the fourth year. They were admitted, but they never graduated. Oh, interesting. Where we were committed to, if we accepted students, that we worked with students, I mean, I tutored, I don't know how, how many hours and so forth, to get people to up to the standard where they, by the time they graduated, they were on equal with the students from any other school. Sure. And that's, that's been Meharry's philosophy throughout the years. Right. And mm -hmm. that's an older school. It's been around for a long time. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's right. uh, 150 oh, yeah. years old. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Well, mm -hmm. very well known. Right. Right. Did the, uh, what about the placement of the students? Did, was that pretty good at that time? What sort well, of it was limited. It was okay. just like everything else. There were um, n a number of, of hospitals that they could go to to do their residences, mm -hmm. internships, and then residences. And unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever, with, um, as the years progressed, almost all of those hospitals no longer exist. Like Homer G. Phillips, you from St. Louis, Homer G. Phillips in St. Louis was one of the main hospitals that many of our graduates went to. Um, then, uh, I'm trying to think of some of those. Anyway, they're non-existent now. Oh, wow. Huh. They've uh, closed? Provident, what was Provident? I'm trying to think of what, anyway. Uh, most of our graduates went to minority hospitals, and uh, with time, the, the, those passed out and closed down because there was no need for them. Uh, with, as it, as uh, integration occurred, then patients could go to, especially after Medicare, when Lyndon Johnson uh, got Medicare passed, and patients could go to different hospitals and the hospitals wanted the money because they knew that they were guaranteed by the government. Then patients started flocking to those hospitals. The hospitals opened up to residents. And so our students could go, would go anywhere they wanted to. Sure. And so, uh, and what uh, the reports that we would get back from these residency programs was that our students performed in many instances much better than some of the other students who were strictly didactic oriented. Our students had been trained to be uh, compassionate and caring and looking at the whole patient and the whole patient's family and not just the disease condition. And uh, the, which, which after a while became kind of the 
modus operandi for schools throughout the country. But we were known we were known for that. Yeah. And th the government realized that in terms of uh, financing programs and all that. Sure. They, and I had, had a record for that. And so that's what we... That's very nice. Mm -hmm. What was that, <clears throat> that uh, Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance? What, well, now, the oh. Vanderbilt Alliance, uh, in terms of the formal uh, <coughs> agreement, was something uh, separate. But it's what I did. I worked with the Department of Pharmacology at uh, Vanderbilt because uh, Vanderbilt had been, you know, fairly elitist. And even when I first came to Meharry, um, the... And, and was working with people at Vanderbilt, uh, particularly Dr. Alan Bush, who was um, professor of pharmacology at Vanderbilt, a, a wonderful man. He and I um, wrote a grant together to the NIH. In fact, it was the effect of cortisone on the isolated, perfused rat liver. Well, Dr. B B Bass, Bass and I uh, got this grant that was just before I left going to New York. And um, Vanderbilt was so discriminatory that the um, black people who worked there, most of them were custodians and so forth, they had to eat in a separate room off in the basement. And so Dr. Bass never let me have to go there. He insisted that I go into the regular cafeteria with him and uh, I, Nobody else, but no other blacks were even eating in there. But Dr. Bass said, you would, you're not going to be treated that way, you know. And mm -hmm. people would walk up to me, people who were sweeping the floors and everything, and they couldn't believe that Vanderbilt was letting someone do this. But anyway, that's, that was a early, my early association with Vanderbilt. And, um, but then after I uh, became a professor at Meharry and uh, was working with Vanderbilt, with our graduate students, then I helped to work out a, a, a situation where the graduate students from Vanderbilt and the graduate students from Meharry had a graduate students association. And the two schools would exchange speakers on alternate months. So a student from Vanderbilt would speak at Meharry to at this association one month. The next month, a student from Meharry would speak at the association at Vanderbilt, on Vanderbilt's campus. So it was this back and forth. Then we decided to have joint retreats together because Meharry Pharmacology Department had its own retreat and Vanderbilt had its own retreat. So a professor there named Dr. Lou DeFelice and I said, well, this doesn't make sense. Why don't we just have joint, since our students work together, why don't we have joint retreats together? And the chairman of Vanderbilt at that time was a lady named Lee Limberg. She was all in favor of it. So we decided to do that. So that's, that's continuous to today. That's nice. At the uh, joint retreat, it was held last month. And they go to a state park, and the faculty and students have a chance to interact. And uh, no one had ever thought about doing this in terms of- Isn't it nice to see it grow and, and, and nurture? It, is, it has grown, and now it's just taken for granted that this is what we'll do. But when it first started off, there was a lot of skepticism. You know, Vanderbilt students would get off the elevator at Meharry, I'd see them. They'd look around, you know, where are we? Are we should we be here, you know? But they, it was expected that they, they would be there, and they came. And then after a few months, it got to be just sure. old you know, hat. Old hat. There mm -hmm. you go. Right. right. Oh, a couple of awards I wanted to ask you about. One was that uh, Leader Hill Faculty Award, the Leaderly, Letterly, isn't that? Uh, you got that faculty award for several years. Right. I had that. Uh, I, I was nominated by, actually, my dean uh, for that. And they, Literally gave um, several uh, uh, each year, and they looked at your credentials and they said it. so. It was nice to pay my salary and gave me money to travel with, uh, you know, to meetings and everything. It was kind of good. It was really good. <laughs> <laughs> I, you got, look, I still have my the same academic regalia that I bought <laughs> out of that Letterly award. That was a, that, when I went to convocation this last year. Same one I'm wearing is. A little faded, but it, it's, it's still wearable. It's still wearable. <laughs> right. The, uh, tell us about that Dolores Shockley le uh, Leadership, le Lectureship and Award in Pharmacology. And I know the opening speaker was this May, uh, Philip McLeish from Morehouse. Right. Well, that was... Uh, that's, something, that's something new. That's new. Right. That's and that nice. was in recognition of the uh, bridge that I had woven between 
the Harris Pharmacology Department in Vanderbilt. Right. So it's the uh, lecture and it's also a partnership award. And the partnership award is uh, given was given to uh, a team from Meharry and B Vanderbilt who have worked together uh, in a meaningful manner to achieve things. In fact, the partnership award this past year was given to um, Elaine Sanders Bush and uh, Ann Blackshear. Ann Blackshear from uh, a graduate of Meharry's pharmacology department. Elaine Sanders Bush is a distinguished professor at Vanderbilt University Pharmacology Department and head of the, uh, I think, the neuro, not neuroscience, I believe brain research. And Anne Blackshear graduated from the Harris Pharmacology Program, but she's a professor. She was a professor at Tennessee State University which is right there in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And together they worked, worked over many years in terms of joint grants and so forth. And so they were given the Partnership Award for uh, successfully working, Vanderbilt working with, through Meharry and Tennessee State to achieve this unity. And then uh, the award was named in my honor because of the fact that I had worked towards achieving this. That's very, very mm -hmm. nice. Very nice indeed. Yeah. What uh, can, uh, when you came as an old master, that was nice. Oh, that was extremely nice. I can't remember what these uh, the ones who show you around. They they have a little name for them. The people. The ambassadors. Yeah. yeah right. And um, it was fun. We went to many classrooms sure. and talked to the students, and then it was very very nice. And then at the uh, prof uh, president. Beringer was uh, president at, at that, that time. At uh -huh. that time, and at the big um, old master's banquet that evening, he, in front of all those people, apologized on behalf of Purdue for how I had been treated while a student here in at Purdue and in West Lafayette. And I was I was very surprised that he did that, because you know years have passed by and. My memories of being here at Purdue and my memories of uh, the education I got here at Purdue are uh, pleasant. The unpleasantness of the community and different things that happened basically have faded so much uh, in my memory that for him to publicly apologize for things that he wasn't even here, you know, but I guess he'd been told and knew this. And it, it was kind of touching, but. <coughs> Excuse me. As I said, it was surprising yeah. because um, it's kind of like you know, in terms of childbirth, you it's very painful in terms of childbirth after the child is born, it fades away. <laughs> you don't right. remember it. You know. <laughs> oh. um, you have a fan. Can you tell us about your family? Is your husband still um, alive? No, my oh. husband died of cancer uh, in 2001. Oh, and. Uh, he had been come, he had been uh, chairman of microbiology at Meharry prior to my becoming chairman of uh, pharmacology at Meharry, but uh, so he had done a lot of things in terms of growing his department a lot, and uh, we have a son who graduated from Meharry, uh, then did a residency in us. Uh, orthopedic surgery. So he's an uh, MD? Right, he's an MD. Mm -hmm. And did orthopedic surgery at uh, Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. And then did sports medicine fellowship after that in at sports medicine clinic of uh, Atlanta. So he's practicing in uh, Cincinnati and he will be here for the uh, presentation at noon oh, that's today. Nice. That's nice. And he has a family. He has uh, two boys. Okay. Uh, Is that you just have one child? No, or? he's my oldest oh. child. Then I have a daughter, my, for, my three daughters. My oldest daughter accompanied me here. In fact, she drove me here from Nashville. Uh, she she could have sat in too. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's waiting for my son to come oh. in. He's coming. Uh, uh, he, he hadn't arrived yet from Cincinnati. He was supposed to be. He's here, probably here by now. But um, uh, she uh, is a, a mechanical engineer. She works at Oak Ridge. Uh, 
Sweet. And she's doing fine. Good. So that's in uh, Knoxville. She lives in Knoxville, Oak Ridge. You know, it's right outside of uh, sure. Knoxville. And so she came to Nashville and drove me here for this occasion. Then I have uh, two other daughters. One is in marketing. She's been working for a, ph a pharmaceutical company as a pharmaceutical representative. And then I have a, another daughter who's a sociologist, so she does a lot of social work. She's very caring about the homeless and the poor and all this stuff. She's not into science and things like this, but she, <laughs> she's more she's the a, social she's a she's a advocate for homeless homeless <laughs> people and everything. Oh. Mm. Um, are you still doing the Meharry Foreign, uh, Foreign Student Advisor? Are you still doing any of that? or No, I gave that up okay. when I retired. Okay. And um, I had served in that capacity for decades. And the interesting thing is that they assigned me that particular p uh, position because I, at the time I had go studied in Denmark. They you had made previous me, experience. Previous experience. So they made me the liaison from Meharry to the uh, Amer uh, American Association of Medical Schools for International Affairs. So I stayed in that capacity for a number of years. And they made me foreign student advisor. But it was interesting. I enjoyed it. I, sure. I really uh, I had some nice experiences with it. Yes. In fact, many times I had to go out and beg for food and get money for them to keep their lights on and everything because foreign students weren't eligible to get um, aid. And uh, most medical schools wouldn't even take you if you didn't have a guaranteed bank account that showed you had enough money to uh, pay for your medical education. But once again, here goes my Harry, <laughs> helping our students, sure. took in any number of students who could not afford to be there. Then the money would run out. Then as far as student advisor, it was my responsibility to, to, to help them out. Help right. them out, right? You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are you doing in retirement? Are you are you staying staying around there, or I occasionally go to Meharry. I don't. Uh, you still live in, in Nashville. Oh, I still live in Nashville. Sure. And I serve on. I was serving on actually <coughs> two committees. Now I just serve on one. I serve on the um, institutional review board, and um, I do that in order to continue to be able to you know, analyze uh, protocols, grants, look at risk to patients and right. benefit and so forth. So I go to that twice a month. I still have an office there, of course, being an uh, emeritus Meredith. professor and have access to the um, services of the um, sta uh, administrative staff. And so I did it like I did a couple of talks and presentations. Since October is Know Your Medicines Week and Pharmacy Week, I did some presentations in, in the community, but I got assistance through the office at Meharry to make the PowerPoints and do things for that. And uh, I did serve on the uh, Clinical Research Center uh, Committee, Advisory Committee, but I resigned from that because I didn't want anything that was uh, too time consuming <laughs> just to do things I want to do. You can yeah. pick and choose. Pick and choose. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh. and, and in some closing, anything that you'd like, how you'd like to summarize, anything in general you'd like to say, I leave it up to you. Or even if you want to even share an outstanding event, if you have one of those. But well, I the, think that. Um, I'll leave the wrap up to you. <laughs> I think that uh, as I look back over all the experiences that I've had, and of course, um, the, at each stage of my life, things have been pivotal and uh, I guess life changing and direction and so forth. All during my early years in terms of my education at Xavier, I was concentrating on you know, academics and doing the best that I could. And, but I also was more into uh, things that were like writing, I did, I did feature writing, I enjoyed those kind of things, photography and all. And when I came to Purdue, I became more narrow-minded and, and uh, centered on science and trying to achieve whatever I could. And I drifted away from uh, some of the social issues and so forth that I had, had been uh, connected with. 
and also a certain of my religious uh, beliefs, not because I uh, wanted to necessarily, but it was just an absence of environment. Like I'm, for example, religious in my religious, I'm Methodist, African Methodist, Episcopal. There were no churches here and everything. Then, of course, as I see myself drifting from a standpoint of religion and affiliation, I went to Denmark. People in Copenhagen basically only went to church on Easter. They had these beautiful churches, but religion was not a part of their uh, religious attendance was not a part of their uh, d daily activities. But they were the best people in the world, kindest, nicest people. So after getting them back into away from those kinds of things and retire in retirement, in a way I'm going looking at uh, more activism in terms of social act, uh, issues and religious activities, outreach, missionary work, things like this where uh, I didn't, it's not that I didn't have time to, but your mind becomes so consumed with, uh, uh, with the other things, other you things that do. you, you kind of forget. So now I'm back into a, a, a mode, I guess, that's a little different. Yeah, sounds mm -hmm. good. Thank you very much, Dr. Shockley. I really appreciate this. Oh, very you're welcome. Much. Thank mm -hmm. you. <clears throat>